Welcome to our podcast um, that complements the Scotland's Future series. And for those of you who are listening on audio only today, you're missing out because we're in the principal's office. We're in Professor Sally Mapston's um, office today here in College Gate, where I'm going to be discussing the Scotland's Future series with the principal of the University of St Andrews. Uh, Sally Mapston, principal of the University of St Andrews, welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part, Stephen. Earlier this year, the university launched the Scotland's Future series. Um, purpose in the set that you sent out by email, and I'm going to, to, to read this out because I think it's quite helpful for our discussion mm. today, was to stimulate discussion and debate about Scotland's future and support research and outreach work. Can you tell us just a little bit more about why the initiative was launched, please? This really fits with a way of being, a way of engaging with major issues of the day that has been part of the history of the University of St Andrews really since its foundation in the 15th century. When the university was founded in the 15th century, there were huge debates going on, which were of a particularly theological nature, but that theological nature was profoundly political. So I'm talking about, for instance, the nominalist versus realist debate, which was absolutely a live issue at the time right across Europe, particularly in Paris, where many of the early founders of our university had been educated. And it was really polarizing opinions right across Europe. And the University of St. Andrews was absolutely in the, in the thick of that. So some of our earliest graduates, including, for example, John Ireland, whom I've written a lot about, were absolutely at the heart of these debates. And that was where the university situated itself. There is a really long tradition of St. Andrews being involved as a kind of crucible for debate and for the formation of ideas. If you fast forward, say, to the 1960s, you could think about the the distinguished economist Ralph Harris, later Baron Harris, who was such an influential figure under the Thatcher administration mm -hmm. in relation to free market economies. Many of those ideas, whatever one might think about them now, were founded in the crucible of ideas that were being discussed in the University of St. Andrews. And if we take ourselves forward to, to the present day, and if we think about the sort of activities that the Centre for Energy Ethics under Dr. Meta High, all the kind of work that Professor Phillips O'Brien is leading on at the moment in terms of really taking forward how we think about the, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The university regularly situates itself as a place where ideas can be opened up and discussed and debated. And the idea of the Scotland's Future series was really to, to draw on that tradition, but also to give it a particular focus and currency at such an incredibly important time in global history. And to say the University of St. Andrews is here to open up debate, to encourage discourse, to do so in a way that is accessible, is respectful, and is also forward thinking. So this is a great opportunity to not only showcase the, the engagement of our academic and our whole university community, but also on occasion to draw in other experts and give them the opportunity to share our platform. That's really interesting. I, I really like the way that you talked about that 600 year tradition, and this is a continuation. Actually, it was interesting when you talked about the foundation of the universities. Now we were shaped by debate and discussion that was raging elsewhere Absolutely. in Europe. Yes. Um, it sometimes seems that not that much has changed, yes, doesn't it? Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm also indeed. encouraged that you mentioned the work that, that Meta and, and, and Philips have, have been doing, and, and, and they've contributed um, to this um, series. So can you tell me if staff and students, and I take it staff and students alike who should be thinking about um, participating, what should they be thinking about discussing and mm. debating. We've got this 600 year legacy, but obviously there's a lot to be learned from that, but we're very much looking forward. Are there any big particular issues that you think people should be thinking about? It's a great question, Stephen, and also absolutely to reinforce that this is an opportunity for staff and students both separately and together to come up with ideas. We want to encourage anybody who feels there is a live issue that they would like to bring forward to do so. 
I don't think it's for for me to to lay down what the the kinds of issues are that I think we should be discussing. But we know already that the kinds of interests that we've had exhibited is uh, are precisely in areas such as climate justice mm -hmm. and climate change. Areas like responsible debate, which obviously connects up to the whole culture wars um, issue. Um, areas of uh, in, in relation to the, the role of universities, the future of higher education, and areas such as sovereignty, independence, and nationalism. All of these variously are live at the moment. And if we can provide a forum in which they can be richly debated and explored, then from my perspective, as a university, that's absolutely what we should be doing. And I'm wondering, you've touched upon a lot of issues, um, really important issues, climate justice, climate emergency, obviously the big issue, um, a generational yes. issue, the emergence from the pandemic. You mentioned earlier on some Philip's work on the the Russia's war of aggression yeah. in, in, in Ukraine um, and also about Scotland's future. Now, some of these issues are quite contentious. Um, I'm wondering if you could say, and I'm not so much thinking about our audiences within the university, mm -hmm. but I'm thinking a little bit about our audiences outside the university. What role do you think universities have to play? Yes, the University of St Andrews, but also the broader higher education sector in having that productive and respectful debate. So those words, I think, are really important in this context. We are particularly inflecting this debate from the perspective of Scotland's future. So many of the issues that are being raised are obviously issues that are broader than Scotland, but they will have a crucially shaping influence in relation to the kind of future that, that Scotland experiences. So that's the first thing to say about that, that these are in many cases broader uh, social and global issues, but we are thinking about them particularly from the, the, the lens of what they mean for, for Scotland. But then there is a separate question of the role that universities can play in this. And I think this is a, a really important issue to, to take into account in thinking this, this through. Traditionally, universities have been places where people have felt there was a, a freedom uh, and indeed an active encouragement to explore all aspects of a question. That's how we teach, that's how we research, that's actually how you move debate on, is by actually encouraging the capacity to look right round an issue and sometimes to look really hard at the things that we may find difficult. And I think universities have to be absolute bastions and advocates of this kind of approach. But it is also crucial, as you have said, that that be undertaken in a way that, that is respectful, that shows tolerance, that shows an ability, a willingness even to move one's position. And I don't want this to sound in any way as if I'm I'm preaching this. I like to think that I practice it too. And I have engaged on several recent occasions, for example, in talking through issues with our student community. And I would say that my views have shifted, have altered, have experienced greater nuance as a result of the way in which I've been brought to think. And that, for me, is absolutely what universities should be doing. They open up issues, they encourage people to clarify their views and absolutely to inhabit and to say what they mean. I tend to think that that's what good teaching is about. It's about the, it's, it's about, of course, the, um, the acquisition and the utilization of knowledge. But it's also really crucially about defining what you mean and then saying it. If we can help at a, at a meta level, that kind of exercise to take place, then we will be doing something good and we will be doing something necessary. So I'm really interested in, in what you say about universities as a, let me call it a national resource, if you like, for productive debate and discussion, especially at this hinge. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. But just to, to roll back on what you said there, you mentioned what you've learned in terms of some of these big debates and discussions that that that, that, that are going on and and, and from our academic um, colleagues perspective and, and, and broader mm. staff as well what do you think is the value of engaging with the broader public let's say school children policymakers other opinion formers do you think it's important to try and get outside the university environment sometimes into use that to help uh, to, to inform your own work and also your own 
mental development yes as well. I yes I do because universities you know are not the ivory tower cliche and also people people participate in universities mm. they come to universities they work in universities but they have lives beyond universities so at one level I think that whole question of where the university sits is entirely permeable but I also think you sometimes really liven up a debate and bring new perspectives to it if you include and invite in a, a different range of, of stakeholders. And they can be from the local community, they can be more broadly, and they can be and should be across generations. For me, I would say in relation to some of the crucial issues of our time, and climate change has to be at the top of that list, the perspective, the sense of urgency, the sense of commitment and prioritization that younger generations are exhibiting really are examples of leadership that all of us need to take note of. And I think they they can absolutely change the nature of a debate. So again, it's our responsibility when we're setting up these opportunities for people to talk, to say, who do we want to get around the table? Who are really the most constructive cohort to get talking about this issue? Because we're trying to do more than talk. Talking should take us in a particular direction, should encourage us to think of actions that need to be adopted. So I do think that on occasion, it's really valuable to invite other stakeholders in. And I know that several of the projects that we're promoting will be intending to do that. No, they are. And, and they're tackling some of these really important issues. And, and I've just asked you a little bit about how we engage with the, the world outside and the value that that mm. brings to us. Um, but let me ask a little bit about what the world outside gains from a vibrant higher education sector. Now, we've touched upon this briefly. In my view, we are at this, if you like, hinge in our, um, in, 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 in our national story, in the journey in terms of the climate emergency. But we're also emerging from the pandemic, as you mentioned yeah. earlier on, you have um, the UK reassessing and, 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 and engaging with the rest of Europe mm. in a different way. In Scotland, thinking about its future as Northern Ireland yeah, did in, 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 in elections recently. Can we start talking about how are universities as a resource for that wider debate? Do you think that they are a national resource? And do you think that policymakers and opinion formers are fully aware of the resource that they have at their disposal on some of these big questions? I think it's I think it's such a great question that because I, I think there is no doubt, and I think our experience in the pandemic has shown that universities really are um, a repository of expertise. And we shouldn't shy away from the value of expertise. It's been proven in the past couple of years to be something that socially and culturally uh, we have absolutely needed to draw on. And I think we have seen, if you like, a sort of a, a rebasing of the way in which we think about experts and expertise in a manner that I would say perhaps needed to happen. And so much of that has come out of universities. There can be something, I think, really both reassuring and invigorating in hearing an expert talk, because you realize that you are, you're being taken somewhere when, mm. and, and that that knowledge is being shared with you. And that sense of exchange, I think, is is really valuable. And we've seen countless examples of it over over the past few years. And obviously, I'm thinking, particularly in this university, of, of people like Stephen Riker, who's expertise in a particular area that many people would probably have not thought very much about uh, until the past couple of years has been a, a really remarkable and sustained example of how expertise can make us all think differently. Are universities properly appreciated uh, in terms of what they offer? I don't think they are. And I think there are various reasons for that. Um, we've moved on so much from the 1960s when, you know, when, when there were about three television channels, you regularly saw, as it were, great exponents from universities appearing and giving their views, often at considerable length. We've moved on from that perspective. I'm not saying that we should go back to it, but I think that sense that universities regularly had a kind of respected platform where opinion formers could uh, from which opinion formers could be invited to appear in the media has rather has been diluted and has moved on. So I find that really interesting. And I find this issue of how you communicate ideas mm. particularly interesting yeah. because 
what I think people like Stephen Riker have been able to do very effectively, but you mentioned um, other colleagues as well, is to put some very difficult um, issues, but also very complicated issues, in a very um, concise yes. way. So in what sense do we need to learn a little bit about how we communicate um, with, with each other? I'm talking about from an academic perspective, but also the way in which we talk to each other in society as well. And you mentioned the range of media sources. Now, we know you've got television, radio, social media, and some of our colleagues are very active on social media. That has its upsides, but it also has its downsides um, as well as we're aware. So what what do you think we have to learn about how we talk to each other, how we communicate each other when we go back? And I'm going to go back to these words, a respectful and productive debate. What's that mean yeah. in this day and age? I think it's possible to espouse simplicity without simplification. And that's the art of it, really. Mm -hmm. the, the risk of social media and the Twitter sphere is that you, you simplify um, and, and you exaggerate. You exaggerate in order to get attention and that can act as a kind of trigger to people to pile in in a way that seems superficially very satisfying because it's a sort of mob mentality. Mm -hmm. I think we need to get right past that and actually um, turn it round and look at what people like Stephen have been able to do, which is to take really difficult issues and to express them concisely, simply and compellingly. And that is about communication and it is about being able to do that act of translation from the expertise, which is the result, is acquired as a result of many years of, if you like, hard academic labor. But there is a responsibility to be able to translate that into terms which which are compelling to those who hear them without simplifying the issue, but on occasion by making it as simple as it needs to be. And that's the equation that I think many of us need to put a bit more work into. But one of the ways of doing that is by actually looking at some of the most successful vehicles for the, uh, for the translation of those ideas over the past couple of years. And some of them are absolutely this kind of form. I think podcasts are, are terrific. Hearing people talk and interact is great. But actually, in, a, in an interesting way, the, the newspaper column has assumed a greater significance than perhaps, I think it had, you know, comment pieces mm -hmm. had perhaps lost um, a, a bit of telling power over the past few years. My sense is that in some ways they've actually come back now because comment informed expert comment on issues of the moment has seemed suddenly so much more pertinent to people's lived lives. So I think there's a, a little bit of a, a change going on there. And from my perspective, it's a, it's a change for the better. You've touched there about the different modes, how we communicate with each other. How do we, we don't make progress unless we disagree with each other and we have debate and discussion. If we all agree with each other, there's yeah. really no point in parliaments and in, in, in debate and even in these series. From your experiences, and I'm going to ask you for your own experiences, how do we disagree with each other a little bit better so that we have that productive um, process? The first thing we have to do is learn to listen properly you actually really need to to listen to the argument that's being put to you, which you may disagree with, but you need to listen and you need to understand where it's coming from. So respect isn't just waiting for your turn to speak. It's about trying to put yourself into the shoes of the other person. When I've been talking recently with students from our trans community, for example, one of the things they have really effectively enabled me to do is to turn around the experiences we've been discussing and look at them from the perspective of somebody who feels vulnerable or who feels marginalized. Putting yourself in somebody else's shoes can sound simple. It isn't, mm -hmm. actually, mm -hmm. if you do it properly. So I do think that responsible debate carries with it the capacity to listen and to think right round. And I think if you establish that as a ground rule, that you're not just waiting for your turn um, and you're not waiting to show how clever you are in, in debate, but you're actually waiting to uh, engage, um, to think through and to challenge yourself. This is, debate is not just about challenging other people. In its most sophisticated and most meaningful form, it's about challenging yourself. And just finally, thank you for that. We're coming to the end of our podcast. So 
what I'd ask the final question, have you got any final messages, comments for anybody who's thinking about taking part, anything that and we've covered a lot of ground, but is there any any final messages you'd like to stress today? We have funding for, for the series and we are looking for projects that can be small scale, which can get funding of up to a thousand pounds, or projects that can be larger scale, which could get funding of up to three and a half thousand pounds. So you could start small with your project. And I would encourage people to get involved. This is an opportunity to do something different, to shape the way we're all thinking about the kind of society we want to inhabit and to get your own voice out there, something we're always really keen to encourage people to do at the University of St Andrews. So Scotland's future is about everybody and it's for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Principal. Um, And thanks to everybody who's listened today. Thanks. So you heard it here. Have your say, have your voice, get involved. Thank you for listening today.